from Wana Brands, welcome to Enhance Your Life. I'm your host, Jonathan Small, and each week I talk to people from all sorts of professions and backgrounds about how cannabis has enhanced their lives and how this healing plant can enrich your life too. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Enhance Your Life podcast. My name is Jonathan Small. It is a pleasure to have you with me today. Very excited about this episode. We get to talk about one of my favorite topics, sleep, with the preeminent sleep expert in the world. I mean, if you didn't know this, 70 million people in the U.S. alone suffer from some sort of sleep disorder, and you are probably one of those people, or you probably know somebody who knows one of these people. And many uh, are turning to cannabis to help them sleep and stay asleep through the night. But how effective is cannabis and how good is it for you? So to help us sort through this question, this burning question, we have Dr. No pun intended. Yes, sorry. There's so many cannabis puns. I know, it's ridiculous. (laughs) With With growing concern, no. Um, So Dr. Michael (laughs) Bruce is here with us today. Dr. Michael Bruce, he is also known as the sleep doctor. And that is because, as I said, he is one of the foremost authorities on sleep related issues. Dr. Bruce is also the author of The Power of When, which is a biohacking guidebook that helps you find the perfect time to do everything based on your genetic biological chronotype. You might have seen Dr. Bruce on the Oprah show. He has been on Dr. Oz, God, almost like 40 times. He is a regular on that show. And um, welcome to the show, Dr. Bruce. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. And I'm really excited to talk about this topic. I think it's a topic that kind of perplexes a lot of us. And that's because there isn't really a lot of research, right, on cannabis and sleep. I mean, this is a problem in general with cannabis is that, that because of its federal illegality, there are not a lot of at least U.S. studies on sleep. But what what do we know? Well, what do you know about, about <laughs> <laughs> what what are you so, telling people these days? So here's the so first of all, thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited to be here. I've written extensively about this, so if people have an interest in my blogs, we'll we'll put them in the show notes so that people can check Perfect. them out. Um, okay. But at the end of the day, look, number one, people have been using cannabis to help them sleep forever, okay? This is not a new thing that's going on. The question really is, is it healthy? Is it helpful? Is it harmful? And basically, if it isn't harmful, what should I do or what should I not do, right? I mean, those are kind of all the the basics behind what we're talking about here. So number one, does cannabis help you fall asleep? I'm not answering it if it's a healthy or a not healthy way. I'm just saying, does it help you actually the act of falling asleep? Yes, it does. Um, So here's what we know. And and to be clear, it's THC that's doing most of the heavy lifting there. So when we talk about THC, and I'm going to go into a little bit more depth on THC in a little while, when, when we're looking at THC, it actually lowers anxiety right? I mean, this is, again, nothing new here, right? We all know that if people uh, use uh, cannabis-related products, we start to see a lowering of anxiety uh, pretty quickly after use. What then happens is the natural sleep process can then kind of take over and allow people to fall asleep. Now, that all sounds well and good. Oh, Michael, that sounds great. No problems here. Unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't actually work quite as simply as we would like. So, uh, you know, John, you, you mentioned earlier that about research. So if we go back to the research, so first of all, there has been a decent amount of cannabis research, but it was done like in the 50s and the 60s. And it was done in, under very strange circumstances, very weirdly controlled circumstances, as well as the fact that the I would argue that the percentage of THC that was in the marijuana that was being used during those research studies in the 50s and 60s is not even close to comparing to the THC that we're seeing now and the hybridization of the plants that we're seeing now. So here's what I can tell you. Old research on cannabis. Here's what people would say. If you got stoned, it made you fall asleep. It reduced REM sleep and it increased heart rate. Those were kind of the basics from back in the day right? It was, yeah, it may make you fall asleep, but we're not really sure. Then they started to look at something called sleep architecture. Sleep architecture has to do with, are you in stage one, stage two, three, four, REM, those kinds of things. One of the things that we know for a fact about cannabis 
is that in fact, cannabis reduces REM sleep. It's a fact, okay? It just does. The THC portion of it is what does what we think does the most of it, but we'll get into a little bit of that in a second as well. And so people might say to you, well, is it bad to have a reduction in REM sleep? Because it sounds bad, right? It sounds like I kind of should have all the REM that I should be getting, right? So this is actually where I fell into my interest in cannabis. So uh, I'm going to digress for a second and tell a quick little story about why I got interested in this. So when I was doing my residency at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi, I worked with a large group of veterans and I worked in their addiction center and their PTSD center. And so number one, I have tremendous respect for the military and for all the people that put themselves in harm's way for my freedom. I wanna say thank you um, also to the first responders and all of those people who really put themselves in harm's way for, for all of us, right? So when you do something like that, what ends up happening is a switch gets flipped in the back of your head. I call it the hypervigilance switch, okay? But if you've ever talked to anybody in the military and they've been in an active theater of war, this is the thing that makes them stay alive. Their head's on a swivel, they're always looking around, they're always monitoring, they're making sure that they're safe, okay? Unfortunately, that switch does not turn off. Once it flips on, it apparently stays in this on position, if you will. Again, this is an analogy, there's not actually a switch inside your brain. <laughs> um, the only thing I've actually found that turns the switch off is cannabis. And I found that to be very reliable and very reproducible. And I've been working with different types of people for very long periods of time. And that was the only thing that I ever saw that worked in that veterans population. Fast forward to now being a clinical psychologist, a sleep specialist, doing all these kinds of different things. And now, fortunately, cannabis is moving more towards legality in all 50 states. I, I know we've got it medicinally in like 26, 28, and recreationally in 14. Honestly, I can't keep up with it. It's, it's Right. Like, it's, it's almost insane that it's not federally legal at this point, but we, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we should bring that part into the conversation because of the federal illegality of it. We don't have a lot of research here in the United States. Israel has a boatload of research. Right. Israel's been doing a fantastic job of running research on cannabis for quite a long period of time. And they have really made some very interesting advances in it, which I think are, are, are things that we can learn from, from a sleep perspective. But when we start to talk about all the different things that cannabis does for us, again, here's what it does. It makes you fall asleep faster. It appears to decrease REM sleep, and it appears to increase stage three, four sleep, which I didn't mention before. So let's talk about this again, this decrease of REM sleep. Is it good? Is it bad? What's going on? Here's why it worked really well for PTSD people. Nightmares. Nightmares occur during REM sleep. Cannabis reduces REM sleep. Therefore, cannabis reduces nightmares. It's literally that simple, hmm. um, right? Which is yeah. kind of fascinating when you think about it, right? And so if you're a person who's experiencing a whole heck of a lot of nightmares, cannabis might make a whole lot of sense for somebody like you. I'm not giving medical advice here. I just want to be clear about that. I'm just talking about the science and how it works. Does it reduce dreaming in general? Because REM is when you dream. It does. Okay. It does. Interesting which is part of kind of the, the thrill of it all if, if we're trying to accomplish the goal of lowering nightmares and things like that. Now, here's an interesting little statistic. People are like, oh, well, I don't care. I need my REM sleep. I don't have nightmares. Why, why would I ever want to do that? Very interesting little factoid. Uh, anybody out there who is currently taking a serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitor known as Prozac, Zoloft, antidepressants, all of those reduce REM sleep more than cannabis. <laughs> Okay. So. so we have millions and millions and millions of people who are on these drugs who have lowered REM sleep, significantly lowered REM sleep. Okay. So when somebody turns to me and says, no, 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 Michael, people can't do cannabis because you lower REM sleep. I say, okay, so are you saying we should take everybody off their antidepressants right. now? Nobody asks when, about those. They only ask with cannabis for some reason. Like Exactly. Exactly. So let's, let's have this comparative, you know, and, and again, and just to be clear, I'm not saying get off your antidepressants at all. What I'm saying is, if you receive help from an antidepressant, it is reducing your REM sleep, and that is actually helping you. Cannabis has an interesting property in that it does something similar. It may or may not have anything to do with your mental health, but it is going to reduce your REM sleep for sure. Now, when we start to think about the other thing, which was the increase in slow wave sleep, all right, Michael, well, what is that? That's actually your physical restoration. 
So that this is part of the reason why people fall asleep quickly and they feel pretty energized when they wake up if they haven't gotten completely stoned. And that's the whole uh, art of it here is there's a really big difference between going to sleep and getting stoned. And so if you're interested in using cannabis in a medicinal sense, while you may feel the euphoria or the psychedelic -y feelings of it, at least initially, the goal here is not to get blotto, right? The goal is not to get so stoned that you boom, pass out. The goal is to help lower that anxiety and allow some of the other constituents to get through the system to actually really work for you. So one of those things is CBD. I'm going to make this very, very clear. There is no conclusive evidence to suggest that CBD by itself will make you sleepy unless you have a dose greater than 180 milligrams. That's a lot of CBD. <laughs> That's a lot of CBD. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So for folks out there who are walking into dispensaries or seeing CBD in the grocery store or, you know, doused over a pillow. I mean, we were having a funny conversation before about people putting CBD on pillows and aromatherapy and all this stuff. For sleep, it isn't there, guys. The science just isn't there yet. Now, can, do we see um, CBD helpful for things like pain? You bet. Do we see CBD helpful for things like anxiety? 100%. Okay. And could that actually be helpful for sleep? Tangentially, I would argue yes. So if you have CBD that lowers your anxiety and then allows the natural sleep process to come over, I think that could be helpful. But to be clear, I think THC does a much better job of that and faster job of that in most cases. There's some, there's another constituent that's kind of cool called CBN. Many people don't know much about CBN, but to give you a really kind of understanding, it's old weed, okay? It's oxidized THC molecularly turns into CBN. And believe it or not, there've actually been one or two studies that have showed that CBN does make people feel a little sleepy, but it's a great anti-inflammatory and it's a great anti-anxiety. And here's what's kind of cool about CBN rather, not CBD, CBN rather, is that again, since it is oxidized THC, it still has some of those Delta-9 componentry to it, which can also help uh, reduce anxiety even more. So if you would be looking for a sleep preparation, like if you went to the dispenser and you're like, I want some sleep weed, what does it look like? You're gonna wanna have CBN in it on some level, because it appears as though it can be quite helpful. Talk to me about the different terpenes. So the CBN, it's, look for the CBN, look for CBD THC combination. What other terpenes have you looked into? So I've actually done a little bit of digging on terpenes, and there are several out there that have got real sedative properties to them. Myrcene is certainly one that's you know pretty well known. So is linalol, uh, as well as limoline. But there's also some ones that aren't as well known. There's one I found called carophylline, C-A-R-Y-O-P-H-Y-L-L-E-N-E. <laughs> That's a really interesting one. And then there's one called terpenol that also has got some sedative effects. So myrcene, carophylline, limoline, terpenol, and linalol are all terpenes that do appear to have some sedative properties to them. Now, when you think about the effect that cannabis has, I look at the cannabidiols, CBD, CBN, and THC as kind of like the horsepower of the engine. And I look at the terpenes as kind of like the GPS. Like the terpenes are going to send you on your journey in the particular way, shape, and form that you're going to get there. The THC is the power that's going to kind of push that through your system, right? The CBD is going to balance that out. And the CBN is going to give you a little bit more anti-anxiety relief, but it's really this terpene profile that I would be looking at for people, especially when you're looking at the, the sleep related um, substances that you kind of see in the dispensary. I, I really would be looking for some of these terpene profiles. I even heard that there are some groups that are doing terpene only sleep preparation. So no THC, no CBD, no CBN. And that feels more like an aromatherapy yeah. um, than really a true, uh, you know, it just happens to be aromas that were taken from, you know, cannabis and, uh, and yeah, what's the difference there between like, yeah, taking a lemon based, um, right. Limoline, yeah, lemonine, right. right. That is so interesting. Wow. Isn't that cool? That's, that's there, there's so much to unpack there. What about if, you know, a lot of times cannabis companies now are combining things outside of the cannabis plant? Yeah. So let's talk about that as well, because it, it gets very interesting very quickly. Um, so first of all, um, 
as an example, we see a lot of preparations where there's THC and then there's lavender, there's melatonin, there's chamomile, um, there's passion flower, 5-HTP. I mean, the list is fucking endless, right? Like on and on and on, right? And so here's the thing. We don't actually know what happens when you vape melatonin. Like, what does it do to the chemical structure? Does it change the chemical structure? Does it make it more effective? Does it make it less effective? Honestly, I don't know. Um, I've never seen any research that showed me what happens to vaping melatonin. I don't know what happens when you vape lavender. I don't know how these things react. So I think we need to be cautious about some of those, at least in the vaping uh, distribution method. Now, if we're talking about a tincture, I think we're a little bit safer when we've got these added ingredients into it because many people have very safely taken tinctures for a long period of time. And we know that the tincture doesn't change the chemical structure of the substances themselves. So I think we're a little bit safer. So if we're looking for preparations where we have other things besides cannabidiols in there, I would argue that you're probably going to want to have a liquid or an edible long before you have something that is vaped and certainly wouldn't want to ignite something because that would really change the chemical structure for sure. To be fair, there are some great constituents that might make some sense to have along with the preparation, right? And so again, in the tincture format, maybe melatonin makes sense. To be clear for folks out there who are listening, melatonin is not a sleep initiator. Melatonin is a sleep regulator. So melatonin basically tells your brain what time to go to bed. That's very different than actually making you feel sleepy. That's a different part of the brain. So when we include melatonin in a preparation, something like that might make some sense for somebody, especially people who have a hard time falling asleep or people who fall asleep too early and then wake up very early in the middle of the night. That can be uh, useful there as well. I'll be honest with you though, I haven't seen a whole lot of sleep related preparations in the marketplace that I really have a lot of agreement with in terms of their ingredient profiles, dosages and things like that. Because quite frankly, a sleep specialist hasn't bothered to create something yet which is kind of amazing to me. So I'm happy to be the tip of that spear for sure. I mean, you and I have had some great conversations about you know understanding more about cannabis and kind of figuring that out. So I would argue that we're gonna initially see some preparations that will be like you said, tinctures with other ingredients and, and some cannabis, uh, cannabidiol profiles in there. And then we should slowly begin to move to ones where we, we may or may not require um, something like that uh, any longer. Well, I'm going to have to introduce you to my friends over at Wana because they are in the sleeve space, and I and I know they would love to talk to you. But that you know, no, Wana does a lot of edibles. They are the, the biggest edible company in in the country. But I want to know, in terms of your experience, what form factor is the best for taking cannabis before you go to sleep? You mentioned vaping, and there's not a lot of research on vaping in terms of like melatonin. But do you recommend people ingest, do tinctures, vape? Like what, what do you generally feel? I actually have a couple of different methods for depending upon what's going on. Here's the thing about sleep is it has to happen fast. You can't just wait around for stuff. And so unfortunately, edibles are, really are good when you're well-timed right? And so if you say, okay, I'm going to have an edible, it's about 90 minutes before bed, I'll, I'll, you know, and you can kind of space it out and do something like that, or I'm going to use my, my tincture, I'll use that 30 minutes before bed. Notice I have a difference in the timing there. Edibles are going to take a while because they got to go all the way down. They got to mix up with your stomach acid. They got to get absorbed. Then they got to come back up to your brain in order to have that effect. That's going to take roughly 90 minutes, depending upon how much food is in your stomach already. So remember, if you're using an edible for sleep, you want to use it early in your evening to allow the effect to hit you about when you want it to. However, what if you turned to me and you said, well, Michael, I don't have a hard time falling asleep, but if I wake up in the middle of the night, I, I wake up, I can't get back to sleep. What would I do then? Well, so here we have two different options here. An edible is not going to be a great idea at this point in time. Again, timing wise, it's going to take 90 minutes for it to kind of take effect. You don't really want to sit there that long. A tincture or a dropper might work really well in the middle of the night, right? Because at that point in time, it'll get up and in in about 20, 30 minutes or so. Because it'll, if you sit it underneath your tongue, like so you take the dropper and you put it under your tongue and you let it sit there for about 60 to 90 seconds, it absorbs and it goes in much faster than, than you would normally have, especially if you had a regular edible. Now, let's say you don't want 20 or 30 minutes and you'd rather, you know, hit a vape. 
I don't have a problem if you're going to hit a vape, but at the end of the day, you don't want to get stoned in the middle of the night because you will wake up and feel like crap. You will not be able to drive your car. All of these, depending upon, again, think about it. Like what time do you wake up? What do you want to do to yourself? And how do you want to feel the next day becomes an important factor. So if you do take a hit in the middle of the night of indigo, let's say, or an indigo hybrid or something that's more somnolent driven, I don't think there's a problem necessarily with that. But remember, it is absolutely positively going to have an effect on your sleep, right? And so taking something in the middle of the night for sure is going to decrease REM sleep. But again, balance, right? If you're woken up in the middle of the night and you got to get to bed, you may not give a crap if you're getting more REM sleep. You just want to get some sleep. And that's where that can, might be able to come in. It would be a, a, a travesty if I didn't talk about some of the problems surrounding using cannabis for sleep. Uh, I am pro sleep uh, cannabis for sleep, to be clear, but I also want to give a balanced, um, you know, idea here. A couple of things that people really need to understand is the percentage of THC can have a pretty big effect. There are now some strains, heavy hitters, people like that who have very, very high THC strains and content. To be clear, unless you are a very experienced user you really don't need high, high levels of THC in order to have a somnolent or soporific effect. So high, high levels of THC is not something that's good. In fact, that can do the opposite. Uh, in many cases, super high levels of THC can actually be very disruptive to sleep. So I recommend that you would want a lower THC content for sure. If you're trying to fix your nightmares, then, then you would want more of a medium THC because again, that helps with REM. Everybody's different. I would start with low THC and slowly work your way up and see if that can be um, helpful. Believe it or not, there's also medications that are created from THC that are used for things like sleep apnea and things like that. So let's talk briefly about sleep apnea and marijuana use. Remember, cannabis can, is a respiratory depressant. And if you already have sleep apnea, it is going to make it worse. So you need to be extraordinarily careful if you are a cannabis user and you have undiagnosed sleep apnea or diagnosed sleep apnea and you're choosing not to use treatment. If you have apnea and you're not using treatment and you're smoking cannabis, you are making your apnea worse. That is a bad idea. Other things to think about that I want people to just kind of put into their head, once again, addiction. While there's a lot of thoughts and uh, you know, people, can you get addicted to marijuana? Can you not get addicted to marijuana? I'm not here to have that debate, but what I am telling people is, is if, if you feel as though you require um, something every single night to help you sleep and it's cannabis related, it may be worth talking with a psychologist or a doctor about adding additional therapy that can be helpful with that. At the end of the day, the goal is not to smoke something or vape something or drink something every single night for sleep. The goal is to allow our bodies to have a natural sleep process and to enjoy cannabis if we want to recreationally and if we need to medicinally. But if you have to use it every night, you probably want to talk with a doctor about it to make sure that everything is okay. Well, there is so much good information here. Wow. You are a plethora of information. If people want to, you said you've written a lot on this topic. If people want to find out more about your writing, where, where should they go? Absolutely. So I'm super easy to find. I'm on every social platform and I have a website, The Sleep Doctor, and doctors all spelled out, dot com. I'm again, just go to Google and type in The Sleep Doctor. I will literally pop, pop up right in the front. Um, and then go into my blogs and search for cannabis. I've written, I think, nine almost 2000 word blogs. So wow. you want to know about sleeping cannabis? You've been thinking about I've it. I've been thinking about it a lot. And I think it's important because as the science matures, then we can really start helping more and more people. Because here's my reasoning. You know, people always are like, Michael, why do you give a crap about cannabis? Here's what I think. I'm pissed off that doctors have been gatekeeping Ambien and sleeping pills from people and making people feel like shit for years. You know, it's like they, they show up and they're like, I'm not sleeping well. The doctor just throws them a prescription pad. They go and all of a sudden, before they know it, they are addicted to some sleeping medication or something along those lines. And then they get to go to their doctor and beg, beg, beg for more pills, right? That shouldn't be. I don't think that's healthcare. I think that we have great natural substances out there that can be incredibly effective. Um, do we know all the ins and outs of it right now? Unfortunately, no, we don't, but we will. And I'm confident that we will keep moving forward in this direction and, and learning more. But as of right now, I am pro-cannabis for sleep. 
There are some detriments to it. So don't be so foolish as to think it's only good. But at the end of the day, I think science is going to prove out eventually what we can do. Well, for what it's worth, I am also pro cannabis for sleep because it, it works for me. And I think, you know, everybody has different experiences, but, it, you know, anecdotally, it works for me. And I'm not, and I don't get blotto high before I go to sleep, but I do have a little bit of THC and it, and it does help. And thank goodness right. for that. Well, this has been, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to help clarify this for us. I also recommend taking your uh, your quiz. There's a quiz that you have. I guess it's on the sleepdoctor.com, It is. Right? It's also on Chrono Quiz if people want to go there as well. Right, which is really interesting. It tells you your different chronotype. The sleep doctor, Dr. Bruce, breaks it down into four types, and you will find out which type you are and then sort of how to live your life uh, accordingly, according to you know whether you're a dolphin, a bear, <laughs> a, a wolf or a lion. What is it? A parakeet? A wolf or a lion? <laughs> Not a parakeet. And it'll, I, it's very interesting to find out what chronotype you are. So I recommend that as well. Dr. Bruce, as always, thank you so much for joining us and and um, sharing your wisdom with us. And hope to bring you back. Soon. I'm excited. You know, I, there's a lot of new stuff coming out. And so, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me on the show today. And if people have questions, p- feel free to have them write into you because when I can come back, then maybe we can do some Q&A for folks so that we can even uh, delve deeper. All right. Terrific. Thank you. Enhance Your Life is brought to you by WANA, the number one infused product in the U.S. WANA's entire process is designed to deliver the same great experience time after time. They have spent years fine-tuning their recipes so that their products are delicious, consistent, and potent. For more information, check out wannawellness.com. That's wanna, W-A-N-A, wellness.com. Thank you.